All right, it's preparing. All right. All I'm right. also going to record this as well. I keep looking at your background, man, and just laughing. It's pretty funny. <laughs> so yeah. cool. Sitting there. It was the during beach. the day, we'd actually have a real beach behind us. Yeah. Cool. All right. Let's start. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is BC. I have another special guest of mine, good friend, uh, Mike Wolf, who, as you can see, is enjoying his time at the beach. Luckily, his mic uh, blocks out all the wind, so we don't have to hear it. I brought him on again. Uh, I originally met him years ago, learned a lot from him directly in regards to investing in real estate uh, after I had acquired through a partnership here, a duplex here in LA, the other four properties that are currently a part of my portfolio, I bought through his strategies that he taught me on an investment tour that we did, I think back in 2015. So it's been a good six years, but I wanted to bring Mike on again because I'm constantly being asked, um, you know, how to buy your first investment property. And I thought what better than to bring the man himself who is so, so well seasoned in investment uh, property. So what's up, Mike? Hey, good to see you, buddy. Uh, everything is good. It's uh, I actually really am at the beach, but this background obviously isn't the real thing, but I actually am in Mexico hunkering down uh, for the winter and uh, definitely liking these temperatures a lot better than what I left. So how are you doing? Good. That's funny. And if you guys didn't know, he's in Canada. So that's why he wanted to run away from all the snow and the cold. That's good. But things are good. Yeah, things am, are good, Mike. You know, I'm happy. Uh, good. That's what we like to hear. So, well, thanks for bringing me on. And that's actually a, a topic I love talking about, how to get your first property. Uh, because when I started, I'm, I'm 55 now. When I started, I was 24 and had no clue what I was doing. And and uh, uh, we won't go into this a long story how I got into real estate, but it was, uh, uh, but that's a question I get asked a lot. And, and really the answer to that, uh, ha I wish I wish I would have watched, been able to watch this video 31 years ago. It would have saved me a lot of hassle. Uh, so uh, the truth of the matter is it really depends on what your resources are, where you're starting. Now, some people, uh, a lot of people, when they first get into real estate, they start off where I did with uh, very little cash in the bank, may probably not the ability to qualify for a mortgage. And uh, the answer for them is a lot different than if somebody comes to me and, and uh, you know, they just sold their, their business for, for millions of dollars. They have a lot of money in the bank and they just want to get started in real estate. So I'm going to get, I'm going to give you a couple of different answers. If, uh, you're starting off where I did and uh, money is a bit of an issue. You maybe don't have the down payment. You don't qualify for the mortgage. When you don't have a lot of resources, you've got to get resourceful. And what I mean by that is my very first property, I had, I had like I said, no cash. So I actually, uh, I, I did have good credit. So I, I was able to qualify for a mortgage. Uh, the mortgage broker who helped me qualify for the mortgage said, you need to show uh, the down payment in your bank account, you have to show up from your own resources. And I said, well, define own resources. What does that mean? And he goes, well, it has to be, you have to show that it's been in your savings account for 90 days. And so I went and qualified for a line of credit, wrote myself a check, left it in the bank for 90 days. And then that qualified as a down payment legally. And I went and got a mortgage. I used the line of credit for the down payment. And I literally got into my first home with absolutely not a dime out of my pocket. Now, if I knew then what I know now, I also know that there's a whole lot of other ways uh, that don't involve you having to qualify for anything. So uh, one of them, if I, if I was trying to do my very first deal, I'd never done a deal in my life and didn't have a lot of cash in the bank, I would look at maybe doing something uh, called wholesaling. And what wholesaling is, is uh, imagine that you're, you're driving your kids to soccer and you see this home, it looks like it's been neglected. There's tarps on the roof, the weeds are up to, you know, up to your knees. And it, look, it obviously looks like nobody's been in that home for a long, long time. So then you go and you pull title, you find out who owns it, you track it down, you give them a call. And let, let's just use really easy numbers. Let's say the home is worth 150,000 and the, the owner said, and, and you call the owner, he's out of state. And you say, listen, your home is in really rough shape. And you send him a picture. A lot of times out of state owners don't even know what their property looks like. It's just been sitting there and they have no idea. Or, but anyway, so you negotiate with them and say, well, I'll take this thing off your hands. You know, I, I, this is something I do. I, I uh, buy and sell and fix up properties. I'm willing to give you a hundred thousand for it. I'll take, you, you tell me the possession date. I'll take it off your hands as is like right now. And so uh, now you don't have that hundred thousand bucks sitting in your bank. Unfortunately, you don't have the ability to qualify. So you call up somebody like myself or, or a good old BC here and say, uh, listen, I found this property. It's got 50,000 equity in it. If you're willing to give me 5,000 or 10,000 or whatever you negotiate with us, uh, I'm willing to assign that property to you. So what that means, you're gonna put it under contract. 
you're then going to call somebody else who's going to go do the deal. And if you, if you negotiate with me, for example, I'm going to give you 10 grand. I go and do the deal. Uh, I'm going to buy it basically off you without you having to actually get title to it. I'm going to take that property, flip it. And whether I'm successful or whether I fail miserably on it, you still get to keep that 10,000 bucks. You get paid up front before I even get started on that deal. So if you don't have a lot of cash, that's one way to get in the game. Uh, another way is something called subject to deals. And basically what you're doing is taking over somebody's existing mortgage. And in a lot of cases, you can do that with, with no money. You're just taking over the, uh, the mortgage payments. So there's a number of different ways. Now, if, on the other hand, if you came to me, the other example I gave is maybe you just sold your business and you got a hundred million bucks in your bank account. That's a really good position to be in. And if you've never bought real estate before, I don't recommend, like you just sold your business for a lot of money. Don't be driving around looking for homes. Go find a hobby and go lie on the beach all day and uh, buy turnkey properties. That's another thing that I actually help people do. Buy, let somebody else go find the, the properties, fix them up for you, uh, put tenants in place, deal with everything. And just create passive income for yourself. But I know most more people fit into that first category than the second. And there's a whole bunch of ways. One, one of the things that I taught uh, you, Brian, and uh, you just totally crushed it was tax deeds. And you picked up a home for what, 7,200 bucks at the auction? So uh, you can get single family homes for pennies on the dollar if you know the right strategies. And, uh, you know, for 7,200 bucks, you can put that on, a, a lot of people can put that on a credit card. So there's a, there's a lot of ways to get started, but it really depends on what your resources are. And uh, if I had more time, I could, I could go on all night, just on all these different strategies that really don't require cash, uh, don't require uh, good credit. I know people buy apartment buildings literally using none of their own money. So there's lots of different ways, but that, that would be the easiest. I'd say, I'd say I would look for a wholesale deal. I get in the, in the uh, habit of finding uh, good deals and then selling those good deals to other investors until you uh, create enough cash in your bank account that you can go do some, some other bigger deals. So that's what I would do to get to get in the game. So one question I get frequently, uh, Mike, is people will say, hey, you know, I'm new to the game and people keep telling me find somebody else that has money. But they also say, well, I'm new. How am I going to gain somebody's trust if I'm new and I need to use somebody else's money? So what would your response be to a question like that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And what, what I'd recommend is get really good at something. Get really good at one strategy. So don't, don't be a, just like if you're a doctor, you get paid a lot more if you're a specialist than if you're a, a general practitioner. So if you're going to get into real estate, you don't really have a, a history yet, find something uh, that you can do better than anybody else or that you can do that most people can't do. So I'm going to go back to tax deeds for a second. First of all, I know some people don't know what a tax deed is. So what, a what, a, what that is, when somebody hasn't paid their property taxes in a bunch of years, eventually their homes are gonna go up on the auction block because the counties uh, need this money for uh, their police department, their hospitals, the schools, et cetera. And eventually these homes go up on the auction block. And most people don't have a clue how you do this strategy. So somebody like yourself, Brian, you came to my training, I showed you how to do it. You got, you got good at it, you got some great deals. Now, if you wanted to go and do some more uh, without using your own money, you can go now show other people, look, here's some deals that I've already done here, here's my, here's my, uh, here's some case studies of some deals that I've done. If you're willing to put up some cash, I'm willing to go to the auction and go get some more properties and we'll split the profits. Now, if somebody hasn't actually done a deal, the great thing, imagine before you had even done your first deal with me, imagine if you had no money in the bank and you said, well, Mike, I, I love this strategy, but I've got no cash. Well, you, you're, you're, you could go to, for example, a meetup group or a real estate investment club somewhere. And you're never going to lie. You're never going to say, Hey, these are deals that I've done when you haven't done them. But you could legitimately say, here's some deals that my team has done. Because as you know, I give my students my access to my teams. And so you could legitimately say, hey, here's some deals that my team has done. And here, here's some case studies. Here's what the result was. They got in for you know, 8,000. They sold it for this amount. They got in for 10,000, sold it for that amount. And then you say, there's you know, thousands of these properties are going up on the auction block every single month. And the only thing that stops me from doing, me and my team from doing more deals is we just need more capital. So if you want to get a piece of it, if you're willing to put up the cash, We'll, we'll, I'll do the work for you. You put up the cash and we'll split the profits. So there's different ways to get in the game. One thing I would do is team up with somebody who's got the track record uh, before you. Do your first deal as a joint venture with somebody who's got that track record and then go raise money saying, hey, here's what my partner uh, here's what my partner has done. So once again, don't ever lie and say that you've done things that you haven't done. 
but you can certainly say, here's what my joint venture partner has done. Here's what my team has done. And those are all legitimate. And, uh, you know, obviously if the team got a certain result for another student, why wouldn't they get the same result or similar result for you? Right. Um, and, and that's great, Mike. Another one that I always get frequently, if you were new to the game and you're looking at fix and flip or buy and hold, which strategy would you use and why? Yeah, so if you're, if you're new to the game, um, and once again, it really depends on where you are. Once again, if, you, if you're a retired CEO with a lot of money in the bank, don't create another job for yourself. Flipping homes is awesome. It's an awesome way to get some more capital to play with. But if, you're, if, if I teach you how to uh, successfully uh, fix and flip homes, and 20 years from now, you're still doing it, and you're actually on the front lines doing that, then I didn't teach you really well. Because to me, the, the, um, doing things like fix and flips and wholesaling and all these other strategies are awesome. But the goal is, after you do a couple of fix and flips, buy something to hold and start creating some passive income for yourself. Then do a couple more flips, buy something to hold. And eventually, once you have enough properties that you're holding and you have enough cash flow coming in every month, then you've got the freedom to do whatever you want to do. But if, if all you ever do is flip and you never buy anything to hold ever, then you may have a really nice high paying job. But if you ever get sick and stop working, the check stop coming in. If you ever decide you want to retire, unless you've managed to keep a lot of that money in your bank, which most people don't. Uh, so creating the passive income in the long term should be, in my opinion, every real estate investor's goal to have that money coming in uh, on autopilot. But when you're first starting, if you're, if you're doing your first deal and you don't have a lot of money, then yeah, let's start building up the capital so you can get to that point. And so uh, flipping to me, it's not, I was going to say stepping stone. I don't think it's necessarily a stepping stone because you can continue just because you have lots of passive income when you see a good deal down the road. Doesn't and, and hopefully as time goes on, you develop teams and you're doing less and less of the work yourself and you have other people on your team doing it. So it's not really necessarily a stepping stone, but at a certain point, if you can create enough freedom for yourself, you don't really have to do it unless you really enjoy it. And I know some people that enjoy it. You know, uh, real estate investing uh, can be very addictive. Once you get in the game and you start getting good at it, it's, it's pretty hard to turn, turn that off. It, it, uh, I, I still get the adrenaline rush when I do deals after, you know, 31 years, I still get that adrenaline rush. But for the most part, uh, as you know, I'm a nomad. I travel a lot. And my lifestyle is built on my passive income. And so I don't necessarily have to go do any more uh, deals if I don't want to. But once in a while, I get, I get the urge to uh, jump back in the ring and go and go and do it again. I love it. You know, and, and I remember one of the conversations we were having, Mike, where we were kind of giggling about, you know, all these seminars that charge people like 20, 30, 40 grand, you know, and they talk about certain strategies. Um, I wanted to ask you, because I know I get this question a lot too. What are some red flags maybe people should look out for when they're learning from people, especially when it's like purchase a home with no, none of your own money or no money down? Are there any red flags you recommend they look at? Because I know this information now is so widespread and some of these seminars, I mean, we've come to the agreement that are just a joke. So are there any red flags you would tell people to look out for? Yeah, well, the, the, big, the biggest thing is you know, a lot of these companies are, they're, they're really good at marketing and they, um, uh, they basically know how to separate you from your money. And, and to me, as, as a real estate investor, everything that I do is about return on investment. And so I, I don't mind. I, I would gladly pay somebody 50 grand if they showed me how to make 100 grand. I do that all day long. So I, I don't even have a problem with that. The thing I do have a problem with is people that have never really uh, done real estate deals. And they, they're really good at marketing. They know how to get you into a seminar room. Quite often, they'll have somebody who you know from a flip this show on TV. And that person you see on the stage, you'll never see that person again. And that person, and, and by the way, most reality TV, uh, real estate shows are, are BS. Uh, we, I, won't even go, I won't go down that rabbit hole because I could talk for hours on that. But I, I will say, I think, I think the biggest thing is don't, don't make really big decisions. When, when you're in a really fancy ballroom with fancy chandeliers and they're, wi and they're whining and dining and putting high pressure on you, just like I would never do a real estate deal without doing my due diligence, don't sign up for a coaching program without doing your due diligence. And the great thing is that with Google, we, we can do research on people pretty quick. You, you can pull out your phone and in five minutes, find out somebody's reputation. Uh, so the, the biggest challenge I see is so many people get um, suckered in. A lot of these coaching companies, they, uh, have, they, all, they all use the same call center in, uh, in Utah. And there's a bunch of people there that maybe done one real estate deal in their entire life. And they're, and they're the ones teaching you. A lot of times you might know more than the person who's supposedly teaching you. 
So if, if there's a big celebrity at the front of the room who you're never going to see again, don't uh, don't fall in love with the fact this person you've seen this person on TV. Uh, so I say that's the biggest thing, and just just do your do your homework. And uh, there's so much information on Google. The biggest challenge though is a lot of these companies this year they go around with this celebrity. And then they start getting a bad reputation. They change their name. The next year they come around, different name, different celebrity. But do, do your homework. And uh, a lot of the stuff is readily available online. You know, they'll talk about their reputation. And uh, um, I don't know. Most, most of it is, is uh, BS, in my opinion. What would you recommend, uh, Mike, in regards to people connecting with others right now, especially with like social media? Is there any specific meetup groups or places you would send them to find other people who are interested in investing that they could maybe do some JVs, uh, JVs with? Yeah, the, the, the best places is, is uh, actually, especially before COVID, was meetup.com because you can meet local uh, people in your area. Now, a lot of uh, meetup groups are going online. If you don't know what meetup is, uh, go to meetup.com. It'll, it'll ask you what, uh, you can basically go find people who are interested in th the same things that you're interested in. So if you're, uh, you know, there's people that there's pub night, there's uh, musicians get together, and there's a lot of uh, real estate investors get together in various different cities and just sh share ideas, sometimes JV. Uh, those, those are, that's a really great uh, resource. It's one of the best places to uh, meet local people that are doing the same thing as you. Um, so I really recommend that. Um, there, there's a lot of Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups. There's a lot of online uh, groups as well. I'm a big fan of meeting people in person uh, whenever possible. Obviously, with COVID, that uh, makes it a little bit more difficult. But when, when possible, because I think uh, when, when you actually meet somebody, a lot of times your, your instincts are going to kick in. They're either going to say, yeah, I trust this person. I want to deal with them. Or sometimes they say, okay, well, he seems to know what he's doing, but I'm kind of, I have this uneasy feeling. And I've learned a long time ago. If, if this is telling you one thing and this is telling you something else, listen to your instincts. They always know. Uh, so um, I, I really believe in meeting people in person whenever possible and networking with them in person. But right now, uh, I think a lot of things will translate well over, over Zoom uh, as well. So uh, there's a lot of meetup groups that are now uh, doing what everybody's doing and doing the Zoom thing. So it's a great place to meet other investors. And quite often, you know, when you go to these meetup groups, there's some people that go there, they've got money and no opportunities. And then there's other people that have opportunities and no money. And so just, you can take a lose-lose where, where neither person can really do a deal and you combine forces. Now you've got, got a win-win. And so uh, meetup.com is probably my favorite place to go meet other investors. Love it. I got one more question for you before we wrap it up, Mike. If you were in the shoes of them, top three markets that you would look at for a first time investor in 2021. Yeah, um, it depends on what you're looking to do because your strategy will dictate what market you want to be in. If you're, if you're buying to hold, instead of giving the three cities, I'll actually tell you how I pick the cities and then you can go do your own research and come to your own conclusions. So number one thing I look at, and most people don't even think about this, is how landlord friendly is the market you want to get into. And what I mean by this is, I know you live in California and I love California, great place to visit. I will never own a rental property in California ever because it's one of the worst places to be a landlord. Uh, if you get a bad tenant who's not paying their rent, they can be trashing your home. It can take you over a year uh, to get rid of them. Whenever, whenever you're buying properties in a place that's very much uh, tenant friendly, I think there's a book out there for tenants on how to get away with living in your home as long as possible without paying rent and make your life miserable. And so I don't know about you, Brian, I've never once, in 31 years of investing, I've never once had a bank call me up and say, hey Mike, I hear you're having trouble with your tenant. We feel bad for you, so don't worry about your mortgage payments. I've never had that happen once. If they did that, then I, I would invest anywhere. But because they don't do that, you're still on the hook for those uh, mortgage payments. You're still on the hook for your, uh, for your uh, uh, property taxes, your insurance. Those bills don't go away. If you have no money coming in, and you don't even have the ability to rent it because somebody is in there and you can't get rid of them, you're doomed. You're, you're going to be in a really bad financial uh, ruins in a lot of cases. And so I love places that, are very business friendly, very landlord friendly, very, very entrepreneur friendly. So my favorite market for that, by the way, is Atlanta, as you, as you know. Um, but so that's the first thing you look at. The second thing you look at is what is gonna cause that market to appreciate. And a lot of people don't really put enough emphasis on this. Uh, the reason I'm in the financial position that I'm in is because I, I uh, got 
I was going to say lucky, but not really. I was actually looking at markets that, in my opinion, were ripe for appreciation, meaning they were undervalued. They were uh, the, the things that well, let's let's talk about what causes appreciation first of all, and it really comes down to supply and demand, just like anything else. So if you see a market where a lot of people are moving to, and you get there before everybody figures out that they're all moving there, uh, it's, it becomes a no-brainer that market's going to go up. It's going to appreciate. And so once again, I love it. I'm going to I'm going to use Atlantic because my favorite market. Uh, Microsoft just announced that they're building a major hub in in Atlanta. But the reason that they picked Atlanta and so many other companies pick Atlanta is the government is very business friendly, meaning that they give lots of tax breaks for businesses to open up their offices there. And so let's head office to Coca-Cola, Home Depot, Delta Airlines, Turner Broadcasting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now Microsoft is going to have a major, uh, major uh, office there. Um, and it's because they're not going to pay very much tax. And the reason the government does that is they know that these businesses are going to hire a bunch of employees and they're going to tax the employees to death. So what that means for, for you and me as landlords is if your uh, tenant, uh, first of all, there's going to be more people moving there and that, that's going to bring up the rental prices. It's also going to bring up the home prices. But it also means that once you have a tenant, if let's say right now with COVID, Delta Airlines, I'm sure, uh, I, well, I know they laid off a bunch of people. So imagine your tenant works for Delta Airlines. Well, they can now go to Coca-Cola, they can go to uh, Home Depot, they can go to any of the other major companies, they can go to Microsoft, there's all these jobs being created there. So it shouldn't take them that long to find another job, hopefully. So that's the second thing you wanna look at. The third thing you wanna look at, and this is what most people look at first, and this is what gets them in trouble, is you wanna look at what are your returns gonna be while you're waiting for the market to take off. And uh, if you look straight, just at the returns, hey, I'm going to pay this much for the property, I'm going to get this much rent every month, and you look at that first and you ignore the other two, uh, you're going to be in a lot of danger. One, if you, if you get a bad tenant in the wrong market, or two, if the home stays the same value forever, what that means is that you're going to go back and have to keep working to save up money for more down payments to get more properties. Whereas if you buy a property that uh, the prices are going up, and all of a sudden that home you bought for 100,000, and by the way, in Atlanta, you can still get homes under 100,000, single family home, just so you know. I know in California that it doesn't get you a shed. But if you buy that home for 100,000 and five years later it's for the three or 400,000, that's a lot more money than most people can save going to their job. It's a lot more than you save from that cash flow that comes in every month. And so you wanna look at the cash flow third. If you look at the cash flow first, it's usually gonna lead you to markets that uh, won't appreciate such a, or not anytime soon. I'm not going to mention the cities, but it usually leads you to places that uh, where people are leaving or the population is shrinking. And you also want to go, you want to avoid one industry cities. So Atlanta, as I mentioned, uh, Delta Airlines shuts down. No, pro I mean, we don't want that. Delta Airlines won't shut down, hopefully. But if they lay people off, people can go work at Coca-Cola. If you're in Detroit, for example, and you work for Ford and Ford lays people off, pretty good chance that Chrysler is, is uh, laying people off and, and all the other uh, car companies too. So you don't wanna be in a one industry town uh, because as soon as that industry is not doing well, you're in trouble. So that's how you pick your market. Uh, look at those three things in that order. Um, in general though, I'm gonna say with COVID, people are leaving expensive places. And I'm sure you know a lot of people have left California to go to you know, Texas and Idaho, uh, Phoenix, Vegas, et cetera. And a lot of people are doing that in New York as well. And, and people are going, leaving expensive places and they're going to places where there's more jobs to living. In the case of Californians, they're really sick of the tax system there. So they're all leaving because of that too. But what you wanna do is be in the path of progress, see where these people are going to, and you wanna get into those markets relatively early on. Now, if you're flipping, that, that's, that's buy and hold. That's your buy and hold, how you pick a market. If you're flipping, you can pretty much do it anywhere. And if you're wholesaling, you can pretty much do it in your own backyard. And usually it's, it's advisable to do that to start because as long as you can find deals below market value, uh, then you're golden with, with both wholesaling and flipping. And where are, you gonna, where are you gonna have more access to properties but where you live? And like I said, while you're, you're driving around, I call that driving for dollars. While you're driving around, jot down addresses of homes that look neglected. And, and so you can do that anywhere. I, I don't necessarily, you can, if you're not holding it, I don't care what the, the landlord tenant laws are. So you can do that in California, uh, but also keep in mind that when you go to really expensive markets, if you're flipping, you're gonna need a little bit more capital to get in in a lot of cases, uh, but the paychecks can also be bigger because there can be more of a spread in the prices. 
Awesome, Mike. Well, I appreciate it. Um, you know, as we're wrapping things up, I know, I think it's the 12th this month. I know it's kind of very close. It's right around the corner. You're doing another event. And I know I had brought you on a couple of months ago and you had done one. Can you talk a little bit about that? That way I can offer it to the audience once we're done. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I've um, been doing online on Zoom trainings uh, in 2020 and 2021. Before that, I only did live events and I only did them once or twice a year. But uh, since I was kind of hunkered down and not using my, doing my usual bouncing around from country to country, uh, I decided that I'm, I want to use this time productively because I know there's a lot of people going through transition right now, a lot of people losing jobs, losing their businesses. And a lot of people are really uh, feeling distraught. And if people saw what I see, I see whenever there's chaos, there is so much opportunity. And so I really want to teach people, well, how do you get exactly what we talked about today? How do you get in the game? How do you get started? What if I've got no money? What if I don't have a track record? How am I going to raise money? So uh, we're going to spend three days together and we're going to deep dive in a whole bunch of different uh, strategies. Um, like I said, I know a lot of people are struggling right now. So I just want to teach as many people as possible because real estate investors, I don't even like the term real estate investor. What I like is a term problem solver. And there's a lot of people that are uh, going to be in a really tough financial situation. Right now there's a mortgage, uh, the foreclosure, uh, there's a moratorium on that. So the banks aren't foreclosing. So most people are not in that bad a position yet, thankfully, but that's going to, that's going to change really, really soon. And so as uh, problem solvers, we can go help other people that are in a bad situation, put them in a better situation and get paid for it. And so uh, that's become my, kind of my mission for 2020 and 2021 to teach as many people to ethically invest in real estate as possible. So all three days is only $97. And uh, I'm gonna, we're going to have lots of q and A. I'm going to teach you exactly what I'd be doing, even if I had, once again, no cash, no credit. Even if I'm locked down and all I've got is my computer, as long as you got Wi-Fi and a computer, I can show you how to make money in real estate. And I'm going to teach all my uh, top strategies. I'm also bringing on some of my uh, best friends who are also successful investors. Everybody I bring on, by the way, is not a, uh, a professional salesperson. They're trying to sell you stuff. Everybody I bring on is people are actually in the game doing deals right now. And they're going to tell you exactly what they're doing. And I'm going to teach you exactly what I'd be doing if I was just starting fresh right now. Love it, Mike. Um, you know, I'm going to see if my schedule permits, if I can attend the event and speak. I know you've been asking me a million times and it just never lines up. No, I'm going to, I'm going to actually come to your home and I'm going to force you to be in front of that computer one of these days. <laughs> Love it, man. So um, I appreciate everybody tuning in. Mike, thank you for your time. I'm sure we'll circle back and do maybe another, um, you know, live and discuss a different topic. Anything else you want to plug? I already dropped the uh, event links in the description. I'm going to do it when I edit the video, but if there's anything else you want to say before we end it, your floor is yours. Yeah, I, I just want to say that, you know, obviously a lot of people are going through really tough times right now. And um, I, I think, and I don't want to downplay, obviously, the significance of the pandemic that's going on right now. However, I will say that what, what you do with this time, you know, the, the one good thing that's happened there's a silver lining to all this COVID is it's created more time for a lot of people, including myself. Normally I'd be, you know, like I said, bouncing around from country to country and I love it. However, it did create some more bandwidth and I'm, I'm using this time to create more content to help more people. And what you do with this time is going to really dictate uh, what your future looks like. And uh, a lot of people five years from now are going to look back and say, Oh, well, I'm super successful. And then my business shut down because of COVID and that's why I'm struggling still. And there's going to be other people that are going to look back and say, man, during that, that downtime, I used it productively. And it doesn't have to be real estate, but whatever, whatever it is that your passion is, use this downtime wisely to reinvent yourself. Do what you need to do to come out of it better than how you went into it. And five years from now, you can look back and say, you know, even though there's that horrible pandemic, I used the time really wisely, reinvented myself, and I'm on a much better path than I would have been otherwise. And so I just want to leave people with that because I know so many people right now are not... Uh, they're, they're struggling. They're not feeling good. And I am so optimistic for the future. I am so excited. I just want to inspire everybody to get out there and just look for the opportunity, not, not just in real estate. There's so many opportunities right now for people who have their eyes open and are looking for it. Love it, Mike. Well, hey, appreciate you coming out. Enjoy Mexico. I know we're all going to wish we were there, especially with that beach weather and 
the sunny weather over there, especially the people in Texas, right? Because it just snowed. That was pretty crazy. Uh, I feel so bad. Horrible. I feel so bad for them. I feel so bad. At least in Canada, they're used to it. So <laughs> cool. it's crazy. All right, man. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, we'll we'll link up again, and I'm sure we'll we'll do another YouTube live here soon.